Oh. Like that? Yeah. Hello. Hello. It's going to be that kind of day. So I can go. There's no, like, start starter pistol or anything like that. Or if there is, it's probably illegal in Kentucky. Um, it's part of the podium. Yeah, he was <laughs> done. I did that last night with my son's sippy cup. I got done with an argument. I threw it on the floor. I was like, yeah, bitches, I'm done. Threw a sippy cup on the floor. Is that any better? Hey! Wow, I can hear it. So here's the deal. Um, where to even start? First of all, I start all my talks the same way. You shouldn't believe anything I'm about to tell you. Uh, my name is Bruce Potter. I'm a college dropout. I went to the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Woohoo! Anyone else go to UAF? So that I run this poll every time I give a talk, and I ask and one or two people out of about 1,000 will raise their hand, and then I ask the following question. Did you graduate from UAF? And the hands all go down. Um, I've yet to actually meet anyone in the wild that graduated from Fairbanks. Uh, it was just a like professional school to go to if you wanted to be a scholar, but not actually to graduate. So um, I was scholarly for four years with like a 1.4 GPA. Um, it was a non-negative number. I consider that a, a victory. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, I'm uh, largely self-educated with respect to this line of work. Um, I've written books and articles and edited magazines and all that kind of nonsense, and mostly that just means I can bullshit really effectively, not that I actually know what I'm talking about. Uh, anyone here written a book before? No? Really? Wow. I'll tell you, uh, you don't need to know anything to get the contract, you just need to be able to market well. Um, the first book I wrote, I wrote a marketing proposal to O'Reilly, said, here, I want to write this book on 802.11 security, and they said, yeah, sure, it looks like uh, that will sell well, so here's a contract. And I thought, well, I need to go learn something about 802.11 security now. <laughs> plot it off to the internets and uh, learn something, and then wrote a book, uh, which has been published in four, three languages, um, including English, which I thought was nice of them. So um, I have no certs. I think I never have had a cert, to tell you the God's honest truth, uh, which is kind of exciting. So, um, But anyway, the long and short of it is you shouldn't believe what I'm saying, not just because my credentials are sketchy, but because in this industry, all credentials are sketchy. Um, there are very few... Uh, um, undergrad and graduate programs with respect to information security, hacking, anything like that. Uh, most of them, their curriculum is largely made up and pretend. Um, a lot of the master's programs up until recently were geared around uh, Beltway bandits trying to get advanced degrees to make themselves look better so they can charge more money on contracts, not to actually provide a lot of value to the community. So, um, and I'm sorry, that may hurt some people. Um, it hurts me a little bit too, but things are improving. But honestly, um, what I see some of the college kids coming through universities, the best uh, kids that I see are coming from universities that have, uh, you know, homegrown security programs. RIT's got their, um, you know, got a good student security driven group. Penn State has their IA club, poorly named, but well-intentioned. Uh, there's lots of universities that have these clubs of kids who get together and they learn and they learn about security and they go to conferences and they do all this stuff on their own uh, time because the curriculum can't keep up, the universities can't keep up, so the kids are doing it themselves. So those are the kids. When I go out and hire, I look for kids involved in that kind of stuff or any of you people that are hiring manager type things. I tend not to look at the rest of the paper. Um, that said, that was a long introduction. I didn't mean it to be. Uh, talks are generally kind of long. I tried to go into this talk having it short. Uh, I got done last night, and it was like 65 slides. You know, we'll see how short that ends up being. If we get done early, I've talked to Paul Azadorian, who's giving a talk next door. We can all say, hi, Paul. Ready? Three, two, one. Hi, Paul! There we go. Um, we have a bit of a deal that if he's done early, he's going to bring his crew over here. If we're done early, we'll go over next door. Um, and we may just do it in the middle. If things get really boring and you raise your hand and say, let's get the fuck out of here, look, we'll just go next door and we'll crash his thing. And I'll present off of his slides, and he'll come over here and... You know, it really pisses off, like, you know, security or, or conference organizers where the speakers form a coup and just like, <laughs> we're going to do our own thing. And yeah, that, we, don't, we don't like that. So anyway, um, before I get started with anything technical, um, I wanted to go over this ridiculous thing called cycle override that we do. Um, I'm wearing, we even have t-shirts, so we're all official. That's when you know you're official. Like when your hobby has resulted in the purchasing of custom-made t-shirts. You know, you're like, okay, I've, I've gone into a new realm. Um, 
what we're doing ultimately is uh, we've done a lot of lead up rides, but the big ride next year we're going cross country, um, and it's all a misunderstanding between me and uh, JP. Uh, punk rock is for those people that are so Twitter inclined. Um, JP was getting into biking. He said, I thought we should do a ride to DEF CON. And I'm like, dude, I've been looking to do a cross country ride for a long time. And I sent him all this information on riding cross country. Um, and he's like, man, I'm totally cool with doing a cross country ride. I'm down with it. I know it's like a multi-year training thing. That's great. What I m said, though, was we should do a ride at DEF CON, like rent some bikes and just go tool around, which is a little different than riding 3,000 miles across the country. But he's been a very good sport about it. So uh, we've organized a bunch of rides at different uh, hacker cons. We did a ride across Ohio to get to here last year. Um, and then this year, we did a ride up the East Coast. Um, and then next year, we're going cross country, starting in DC in late June, going the wrong way in the summertime. For anyone that knows anyone that's gone cross country, anyone gone cross country before? Have you? Which way did you go, west to east or east to west? West to east. See, he was smart. The wizard in the back here. This is. <laughs> um, so we're going to go east to west in the summertime. We're going to stop by uh, DEF CON on the way through. If anybody's interested in joining us, we're not going to be burning down the streets going real fast. So, you know, we're happy to have people for any or all of the ride. We should have milestones up hopefully in the next month about where we're going to be. If you want us to stop by your town, party with you, whatever, you know, we'll have a bunch of kids in tow. We party really hard. Um, it re results in children. Um, <laughs> so... My wife is really upset at me already. It's only the third slide. Um, we're, we have two separate fundraising needs. One is we're trying to raise money for EFF. Second, we're trying to raise money so we don't pay for all of this out of pocket. So if you're a security company and you want to sponsor us, woohoo! we get a lot of visitors to our website and stuff, and we print cool t-shirts. Um, and we may actually have a Kickstarter to try to do something creative to get money from people to help us get from point A to point B. Anyway, that's all I'm going to spend there. So the other day when I started putting these slides together, um, you know, I had that dawning realization that I proposed a topic and I really um, wasn't sure what I was thinking. Um, and, and many of you may not either. You may have looked at the, the, uh, the Googleable word uh, epistemology in my uh, title. Um, and that's basically what it was for me. It was this, well, I wonder what this means. Um, it's much like writing a book, you know, giving a presentation is largely in the same thing. I run a small company outside of Baltimore. Uh, we do a lot of information security research. Uh, I could have talked about a lot of technical things inside of threat detection and net flow analysis and all this other stuff that we do. And instead, I decided to go all philosophical, which I was really worried about until I was recruiting at Penn State the other day. I went to Penn State, and they have like a technical recruiting day for engineers and all that kind of stuff. And this guy walks up to me. It's late in the afternoon, and most of the kids have already come through. And he looks up at the sign behind us that we had, and it says cryptography. He says, cryptography, eh? This is after the person who came up and said, can you tell me more about the cryptography? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> it's like, cryptography? He's like, I'm a philosophy major. Cryptography involves logic, right? And I'm like, it, it, in a manner of speaking, yes. He's like, well, I think my philosophy degree should apply to cryptography. I'm like, that's wishful thinking, sir. Uh, <laughs> so he's like, well, you know, do you have anything that I could do? I'm like, I do have some questions about a philosophical presentation I'm giving in a couple of weeks. And I sat down with him. I talked for like half an hour about epistemology, which I'll get to defining in a second. And um, he got up and he was, it was kind of funny. He's like, you know, it's funny. I've been here all day long talking to people and this is the best and longest conversation I've had and I'm still convinced nobody here wants to hire me. I'm like, well, at least I gave you some purpose today, son. Like I was <laughs> so I was really nervous even after that. And then I saw this wonderful tweet um, the other day that uh, InfoSec's fatal errors assuming people are rational. And at first I thought, great. I will provide some rationality to irrational people. And then upon reflection, I thought, maybe I'm the irrational one. And then I got really confused and nervous, and I retweeted it. So um, I don't know who Ghost Nomad is. I discovered he's Cleveland. So that, that makes him OK. Dave gets really excited. He's from Cleveland. Woo! His kids are on your Minecraft server? See, this is the thing. Like Twitter, I've discovered like I, I'm, I'm a one-eyed Scottish black man on Twitter, which clearly I, I am not by day. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very hard to tell. When I come here, people are like, oh, they're having a conversation with me. And I realize, like, oh, you're this person from Twitter that I thought was a woman. Um, <laughs> sorry about the pics. Um, <laughs> wife's really blushing now. Um, 
So one thing I want you to do right now, before I get started in defining this and actually giving the technical meat of what is turning out to be not so short of a talk, I've already lost like five people, which is usually a good sign, because by the end we're just like sitting around the bar because no one gives a shit anymore. Um, write down five things that you believe about InfoSec. Like if you got a tablet or a laptop or the Twitterverse or something, I encourage you, tweet. Tweet at least one thing that you believe about InfoSec. Something you believe to be, this is my view of InfoSec in 140 characters or less. What do you believe about information security and this career or this profession or hobby or whatever the hell brought you to Louisville? Louisville, right? There's no E, right? It's Louisville? Louisville. I mean, I still have too many syllables, right? To Louisville. <laughs> Louisville. <laughs> the place that starts with an L in Kentucky where they all drink bourbon. Every restaurant I go to has a barbecue bourbon something hamburger. Like whatever their local beer or whatever is, they put bourbon in it and put it on a burger, which I think is one of the most wonderful things in the world, bringing together alcohol and ground cattle. Um, anyway, someone's going to give me like bourbon soaked tartar later, which will be really exciting. So five things. Think about those five things. Tweet one of them, whatever. We're going to get back to that in a minute. So. In the beginning, there is truth, or at least we like to think there is truth. For any particular problem or idea or concept that we have, there's something that defines truth. And then there's the things that we believe to be true, which oftentimes are non-intersecting, or at least don't totally overlap. In the middle, this is the philosophical concept of epistemology, is knowledge. So we have truth, we have belief, and the intersection, roughly, is called knowledge. Okay. I should caveat the rest of this conversation by saying I have no formal education in philosophy. If anyone is a philosophy major after I've already railed on the topic once, feel free to throw shit at me and correct. So this is my view of the universe after having talked to an undergraduate philosophy major at Penn State. <laughs> so I just want to be clear where the next 40 slides are going. Ideally, whatever problem, whatever thing we're thinking of, our belief and the truth overlap greatly, and our knowledge of the, top, of the subject matter is large, right? This is what we like to think the world looks like. There's the world, there's how we believe the world to be, and so we know a lot of shit about the world. Sometimes there's a very large gap between the truth and our belief, and it, it doesn't feel good, and it actually has a term called cognitive dissonance, right? So this is when I believe one thing very firmly, and the truth is somewhere on another continent, but yet I, I have to reconcile that. My brain has to somehow bring those two things together, and it's an uncomfortable thing for your brain to have to deal with, so sometimes the truth goes away, and we invent our own personal truth, and it makes us feel comfortable again, because then what we believe and what is true overlap, and I have, I have a sense of the world is right, and it makes me very happy. And this is like the stoned happy. This gives you just a sense of contentness. Woo! So I'll give an example of some cognitive dissonance. Anyone seen Galaxy Quest? Excellent. How many people haven't seen Galaxy Quest? OK, for those that haven't, I'm going to give you the Galaxy Quest overview in PowerPoint. Galaxy Quest is a TV show, much like Star Trek. And like most TV shows, you ever see the beginning of Contact and they zoom out into space and like Hitler's opening of the frickin' Olympic Games are picked up by an alien race? Well, an alien race has picked up Galaxy Quest, the Star Wars or Star Trek-like knockoff. So uh, they see it. They actually have a dire enemy, uh, Salomon or something. I can't remember his name. Uh, <laughs> the lizard dude, I clearly not from Lord of the Rings. Uh, not realizing it's a television show and they think it's a documentary, uh, they build a replica ship, and then uh, they make themselves look like humans, and they travel across the galaxy and abscond with the television's cast of the uh, TV show Galaxy Quest and bring them back to help fight their dire enemy. But they don't realize that these people are just actors. So anyone remember that guy's name in the show? You remember Guy's last name? He did. It's in the credits. Very. Who said that? But dude, you are a rock star. Like, you get the guy. <laughs> Holy ball. Do you remember his name from the credits? Fleegman. I, I think they just made that shit up. Like, no one's last name is Fleegman. Um, someone should Google that and see if that's really besides Guy. Anyway, um, so at some point, 
there's the, the, the aliens come to the realization that what they've done is rather than been looking at historical documents, they've been looking at basically a fictional television show that didn't actually involve space travel and defeating aliens, and they were just actors. The good news is, in the end, they kick the living shit out of the aliens, they all blow up, you know, including at a Star Trek convention, or Star Trek, at a Galaxy Quest convention, there's a lot of overlap, they actually kill the last alien, and he blows up, and everyone applauds, not realizing he was really an alien. It's kind of funny. But the best part of the movie is that Tony Shalhoub really kicks a lot of ass. Uh, He's been in more than Monk, you know. I don't know. He was in Wings, right? I mean, come on. Like, he's a good actor. <laughs> Thank you. Let's give it up for Tony Shalhoub. Woohoo, Tony! Yeah. Even that was pathetic. Um, let's give a real world example the Romney campaign. I'm not here to say I'm a Republican or a Democrat. You might be able to guess. Um, but I did see something very interesting happen the other day. So the Romney campaign had, I think, what most people would uh, like to call a rough week, week and a half, uh, between some things that happened with Libya, which there was a lot of controversy about. Uh, Romney tries to reboot his campaign. That day, the leaked 47% video comes out. Anyway, you slice it, that's just going to cause problems because half of America doesn't like being called victims. Um, you know, he had, he had rough times there. Uh, the tax info came out, and well, he paid more in taxes than he should have, and which he said he should never do because then he wouldn't be qualified to be president. So there's lots of kind of conflicting things that were happening in the Romney campaign over the course of a week. The polls are going down, whatever. 9.23 at the end of the week on the Sunday uh, talk shows, Rince Priebus, the, uh, um, the head of the RNC, says, you know, I think we had a pretty good week. Oh, really? <laughs> like... You invented your own personal truth to solve that little cognitive dissonance problem that you had. You're like, well, yes, everything's fine. What, what video? Um, ideally, our beliefs change rather than inventing our own personal truths, right? That's kind of, the, again, the nature of this philosophical problem, epistemology is, you know, let's not reinvent truth and make ourselves feel good. Let's shift our beliefs. Let's understand what's really going on. So why is this important InfoSec? It's the big question because everyone's waiting. If this doesn't get InfoSec specific, this is just storytelling hour and I'm GTFOing. Like, that's it. So here we go. It's going to become InfoSec specific here in a second. Um, some disciplines, some people that go to conferences and are educated and have jobs, um, do work that revolves around things that are easy to observe, right? Like the world around us. Mechanical engineering is a great example of this. There's lots of things in mechanical engineering that we could directly observe that happen every day the same way. I drop a bowling ball from the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and not only do I get arrested, but it falls at exactly the speed that I expect it to, right? That's what happens. So um, force of gravity, tensile strength of materials, you know, these things are observable truths. And so we can believe in these truths. We have a lot of knowledge, and we are happy. Mechanical engineers are a happy bunch. They're all sated. They're like, yay, I built things, and people don't die, right? That's the goal, right? I mean... The goal is to build cool things that support life and continue on and like bridges, like the Golden Gate Bridge. I was in San Francisco the other day and saw the Golden Gate Bridge for the first time in a long time. And I remember thinking for like the umpteenth time, damn, that thing is cool. Like Golden Gate Bridge is an amazing piece of engineering. And every day, you know what it is? It's still the Golden Gate Bridge. It doesn't change. I mean, sometimes there are earthquakes. You know what that sucker does? Fuck you, Earth. Like, <laughs> I'm still here. That was the wrong, fuck you, Earth, there, I got it right. I was flashing the horns, and my kids are so well-educated. It's right in the front row. Uh, so in our universe, things aren't so constant, right? The only constant, and I'm throwing that out there as even maybe, is that you can't be absolutely secure. Like, that's the one thing you learn. It's just like a cliche. Well, it, even a rock, you know, I got a big fucking hammer. A rock's not secure. Um, the rest is up to debate, you know. We have... A lot of things we try to observe, but those observations can change over time. What we observed last week may not be the same thing that we observe next week or the week after, and it can change rapidly. People find vulnerabilities, people find new attacks, people, new software takes hold, the Twitters are born, everybody communicates very rapidly, changes threat models, and it makes us unhappy, right? 
and we have cognitive dissonance at times where we think we know something or we knew something last week or we knew it last year. I was trained in it. I was certified in this. What do you mean it's not true, PCI? Like, it's... It took me 20 minutes to get to a PCI joke, and, and David's leaving after that. Bye, David. Bye. Bye. If you're going to leave, just can you wave? It's much more polite. Just thanks. And even introduce yourself. Bye, Dave. Uh, there we go. There we are. Thanks. I, I once gave a – God, it was at DEF CON, I think. And it was a pretty big room. must have been like a 1,000 people in it. it that, thank you, David. I appreciate it. And, like, whatever I was doing, it was actually pretty decent. And there were a lot of people, like, sticking around and not getting up. And, like, 20 minutes into the talk, the first person gets up to leave. And, like, the room is packed. And one person walked up the alley. And I was like, hey! <laughs> the guy's just like, stops. And I was like, oops. Like, now I've got to make something funny out of this because I did legitimately make that person feel bad. So, um, I don't know. I think I gave him a beer. Um, the end result? So, do we build bridges? No. We argue about shit. Um, so this was an interesting list that Richard, um, how do you pronounce his last name? Ba okay, we got a lot of conflicting views. We'll just call him Richard. Um, cy what? Cyber, <laughs> cyber, 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 cyber. It's like buffalo, 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 buffalo. How, what's the longest sentence you can make with cyber? Is it eight, like buffalo, or can we do better? Cyber's everything, so I assume we can do better. Um, so the purpose, what struck me about this list, he posted this the other day, and this was a list of like ways to get InfoSec people to whine and bitch at each other, right? Like, here's all the things that you could just throw in a room like a flaming turd. We'll all go, ah, flaming turd, and we'll argue about it for hours. Um, and then other people, of co course, pitch in their own two cents. Like, is pen testing valid? What's the value of certifications? All this stuff people just start throwing out. And I'm like, these are core concepts to our work, and we find it funny that we can't agree on any of it. Why is that so? Right? Why do we not agree? Is it because we all have different jobs that we care about and different ways to protect or do other things to networks? I don't know. You know? But it's disconcerting when we can't figure out how to disclose uh, software vulnerabilities. We can't figure out what the hell cyber war really means and if, it's, if there's value in talking about attacks versus defenses. At ShmooCon this year, we got rid of the break it track, which has got some pushback. And there were various reasons for doing that. And um, I can even get into it right now because I think it's actually kind of interesting. One, there's a lot of focus at conferences on, on attacks, um, and so it's really easy to go to a conference and it's sexy and people want to talk about attacking and pen testing and doing all this other stuff. But frankly, talking about attacks has become diluted in value over the years because we can sell attack information for a lot of money, right? People sell exploit information. They sell vulnerability information. They sell it to people who build the product. They sell it to third-party security uh, vendors and that kind of thing. So you know what people don't get up on stage and do anymore? Drop fucking O-Day, right? They just get up there and talk in the abstract. Or they talk about something they did a while ago or something like that. Why the hell? What? I miss the O-Day. I really do. I miss the fuck you-ness of it, right? It kept us on our toes. It was not a polite thing, and it... It works. I mean, frankly, Dan Bernstein, man, he's a big fan of that. I don't know if you've ever seen Bernstein's philosophy on O-Day. Find it and drop it. I mean, that's not what he says. He's an academic professor. I'm, I'm, I'm distilling his comments, but uh, I'm sure, sure Mr. Bernstein, Dr. Bernstein would have some disagreement with the exact phraseology that I've used. But in general, um, I think that there is value to that kind of edginess, and the value obviously is important enough that people want to get paid for it. So they don't come to conferences, and they don't talk about the things they used to talk about. We talk about Metasploit and all this other stuff, which is great, but we moved away from that. So anyway, there's obviously room for debate there, right? And so the thing becomes, you know, why do we believe what we believe about Inf information security, about the, that list of Richard's 10 things, about the five things that you wrote and hopefully maybe even tweeted, my phone at least lit up with one person, so I appreciate that. Um, why do you believe these things? And it got me thinking about, you know, I'll pick a straw man, let's walk through one example of a truth or some domain of knowledge within InfoSec and see if we can get to why we believe what we believe today about, oh, I don't know, passwords, right? Passwords are easy. Who uses a password? Your mom. I mean, everybody does, right? Like, just like everyone does your mom. Okay. Um, come on, man. It's, I know we're a little late. Thank you. Thank you. That was, yeah, yeah. And that did not need applause. Your mom jokes. It turns out never <laughs> actually need applause. Um, so in the beginning, there were isolated systems. Um, this, this slide actually doesn't exist. Um, here, let's do this. Um, that slide exists. There, there was an errant 
thought there. But um, so we use passwords for a long time, right? I mean, since before we had computers, knock, knock, who's there? Your mom. Oh, open the door. Um, your, your mom was the password. Come on. It's, there's, there's a thread here. Um, and in the beginning, we had really limited systems. Threat of compromise was local. You know, people walking up to a terminal, best they could do is guess passwords. You know, your password did not need to be very complex. Um, as systems became, you know, more interconnected, more complicated, password-based authentication had some issues. One, we could brute force. I watched, I read an interesting thing about brute forcing over a 300 baud modem and how long it would take to brute force certain, you know, character length passwords over, you know, modem. Turns out, a long time. Um, Hashing algorithms have come and gone, you know, MD5, you know, my kids do it on their decoder ring these days. Um, you should not use MD5, I guess is the moral of that story. Um, I need coffee. Um, Client-side trust issues, that's interesting, you know, people are caching passwords now in web browsers, you know, that's kind of a new problem. Uh, there are better alternatives to authentication. So what's the issue, right? Passwords are insecure, you should choose really long complex passwords, you should rotate them periodically, et cetera, et cetera, right? That's what passwords are? Nod, that's how I viewed it. So what's the problem? So let's go read the historical documents. I, I can't talk like them. I was actually going to try. Anyone from Galaxy Quest can speak like them? Nobody wants to even try? That's a good idea. Um, I'm going to give you a minute to consume this entire thing. Can you see it in the back? Ish? Nods? OK. In a nutshell, this is client-side password caching for mainframe access as a threat to the system in 1987, okay? This isn't a new problem with passwords, right? We've had client-side caching problems for a long time. This is from the advisory memorandum on OAS. So this was a DOD document that was published in 1987. Uh, an office automation system is basically a client terminal that apparently you can program that when you t t hit control break, it logs you into the mainframe. Um, I would not know how to program a modern PC to do anything useful when I hit control break. Um, so that's pretty impressive. Um, it's uh, it, it's a, neat <laughs> a neat little trick, but clearly one that they were not fond of you doing. And I thought, wow. You know, when I've done software security consulting, I've done a lot of work, and it struck me that client-side caching of credentials is something that was really only came about when the modern web browser came around, or at least some thick client stuff, maybe in the early 90s kind of thing. This is a problem we've had with mainframes since the 80s. You know, that struck me as interesting. So, you know, my, my belief and the truth got a little bit farther away. So then I got to thinking, well, why do we rotate passwords? You know, that's usually a good plan, right? You got to rotate your password. You got to choose them a certain length and certain complexity, right? These are all things we tell all our users, right? Here's our password policy. I, I, I don't know how to type that character. Tough shit, figure it out. It's control alt and there's a whole universe of things that you can type, okay? <laughs> Let's check the historical documents again. This is another DOD. This is the password management guide from 1985. You would think it'd be massively out of date. Well, it actually has some very interesting information in it, including one of the core pieces of work about why we rotate passwords the way that we do, right? This document has some mathematics regarding password length, how, uh, um, you know, how long in between a likely compromise, uh, and a lot of mathematics regarding probability of how long a password needs to be in characters and the complexity of the alphabet and that kind of thing. Um, and it even talks about passphrases. At the time, in 1985, a three-word passphrase was much stronger than an eight-character, 36-letter uh, um, alphabet uh, password because it was like landman. It all got too uppered, so there was no, no uh, lowercase. Um, but the first sentence of this thing that we've used as a justification for why we rotate passwords and why we choose com uh, passwords as complex as we do is this. So is that true? Is password, is, is really the security afforded by the password a probability of it being guessed? Well, 1985 it was, right? 
And for all this math that it had, that's what it was all predicated on, the fact that a password could be guessed. But really, let's talk about guessable passwords. Here's the Gawker password dump. So this is the top, whatever, 12 passwords for the Gawker password dump. You know, clearly, easily guessable passwords. If they had chosen real passwords, even though they were hashed, or if they had chosen real passwords, the hashing algorithm would have protected them. We would never know their passwords, right? I mean, a good hashing algorithm, a complex password, too complex for us to, to figure out. So um, let's look at another password dump. Here's the analysis of the IEEE password dump that happened the other day. You guys know the nature of that dump? Log files, HTTP log files. Passwords were in the clear in the log files. And largely the same distribution of stupidly chosen passwords. So if the users had chosen a better password, the hashing algorithm would have protected them, right? Oh wait, they weren't hashed. They were stored in a log file, completely outside of the how they're normally stored. They just got written to disk because somebody had to look at web server logs. So the users, doesn't matter if they had chosen a good password or a bad password, in the case of the IEEE dump, their password was given up. Not through brute force guessing, but because the system that they gave it to wasn't trustworthy. Passwords get popped in this day and age because we suck at doing our job, right? We can't protect them in the system, right? If they're hashed or not, they get leaked, okay? Onesie twosies, people get popped. In the millions, people don't get popped, we get popped, right? How many of those users on that Gawker list got owned prior to the Gawker dump because their password was one, two, three, four, five, six? I would hazard to say at most one, maybe two on a good day, right? And those are probably like ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend situations, right? How many of those people got popped after the Gawker dump? A whole hell of a lot of them, right? What about the IEEE dump where it wasn't hashed, it was just in the thing? How many of those people got popped before and after because of their poor password choice? Their password choice didn't make dick a difference in the IEEE case, right? So what's interesting to me is that we force this rotation policy. We force all this crap on the users to remember passwords. Then we get bitchy when they write it down. Really? Like the only people, like, uh, honestly, again, how many compromises happen because of that? I'll give you some compromises due. But Eastern European crime rings aren't roaming around your office looking for passwords so they can log into Bank of America, okay? If they are, I'll do your physical security for you. Uh, my kids will do the physical security for you because they'll do a better job than whoever's doing it now. Um, at the end of the day, people's passwords get popped, not because they're shitty, not because it's one, two, three, four, five, six, it's because we don't do our job. And forcing users to rotate their passwords and all that other stuff is kind of silly when you look at it from that re regard. Wow, yeah, wow, there's a cat. So we've got Galaxy Quest, we had, you know, Sir Patrick Stewart, we had a cat. I think I've, I've, I've used up all the internet memes from, the, from like four years ago. Um, and, and again, say, <laughs> uh, no. Um, so I'm not saying any of this is right, okay? I think it's right and it makes me happy. Um, but it's one way to think about passwords. Um, and it's one way to think about a complex problem that we deal with every day. Like we deal with password authentication in our jobs every day. Whether you're an attacker, whether you're a defender, this is something we deal with. It doesn't get, from a, from a computer security perspective, it doesn't get much more simpler than passwords. And to this day, we still can't agree how, how to protect them, who we're really trying to protect them from. All we do is bludgeon the user with the, the stupid stick and be like, make better passwords. The user should hit us with sticks. The, Don't put them in fucking log files. Right, so I got it. Sorry, sorry. Like, we have like a thousand users and two people to hit, you know, with sticks to hit. And if it was the other way where they were all lined up to hit all the security guys all day long, we'd figure out how to do our jobs, right? Like, or you'd really enjoy it. Hope that makes it to YouTube. Oh, God, you guys are putting these on YouTube, right? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. That's. I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning then. And we're going to restart. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, wow, that's, that's a lot of updating. Um. So what? So <clears throat> we are, live in a world that's driven by belief and not truth. We don't have a lot of hard facts. We believe passionately about this. You don't believe, you, you don't take this kind of line of work kind of casually and then show up to conferences on weekends, right? Like that's the one thing I keep coming back to. Like people who give a shit about their job and really care about this and want to do the right thing 
show up at 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning to Louisville or Cleveland or downtown D.C. or, well, Las Vegas, you're there anyway. So, um, you know, you, you go do this because you care about it. But we have to understand that our worldview and what we believe isn't necessarily the truth. And it, it'd be nice if we treated others with respect, if we tried to not, you know, um, bludgeon each other in the Twitter, Twitter echo chamber so often and try to move the ball forward and understand where are the fallacies, where are the things, uh, uh, you know, the areas of concern that we have today where maybe what we believed last year or the year before isn't what we should believe today. Um, and by looking at that and having honest discourse between our beliefs and what's truth, that's how we gain knowledge as a community. That's all I'm trying to get across today. That's it. We're done. Any uh, questions? I, God, I don't know. Sir, really? That's amazing. I thought for sure people would be like, nope, what? Right. So, so the concern is that we're training users that cognitive dissonance is okay by engaging in phishing campaigns as a way of security awareness training. Because all that happens is we basically fish them later with legitimate emails and tell them, no, 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 that one's all right. Right. So I used to work at a large uh, defense contractor, and we would have phishing, you know, drills and security awareness. And then one day, I got an email from one of the partners but it came from an external address, it had misspellings, and it said, we're updating our emergency, you know, uh, whatever, ER contact list, please go to this website, enter in all your personal information so we know how to contact you in the event of, you know, some sort of emergency for the organization. And I was like, oh, get bent. And I was like this far away from responding back to the Fisher of like, you know, go screw yourself, here's all my up yours at, you know, screw you.com and everything. And I thought, no, no, no. I'll check with his assistant just to make sure. And I call her up. I'm like, I got an email about, oh, yeah, we're getting a lot of calls about that. That's totally fine. Go fill it out. That's something that we need to do. And I'm like, you people are all crazy. Like, what is wrong with you? But it's, it's exactly the problem that we're like, you know, in this, in this space, we like to think that the world is very clean and we can train people on, you know, fishing. And we clearly can't because we can't get it right ourselves. Um, I mean, that gets to a big problem with, I think, a lot of the, the education and awareness issues is that, um, we train people in a very clean room about how InfoSec works. And we all know InfoSec isn't clean, right? This isn't a pretty world that we live in. Users are dumb. Attackers are smart. Um, you know, it's why, again, getting back to the O-Day thing, we are not the British fighting the French standing across from each other, shooting at a line of people all politely, and then, oh, oh, Billy died. And then someone comes up and takes Billy's place, and then we shoot again, you know? Because... We, we, we are the people standing in line, and our adversaries are behind the tree shooting at us, and they're a lot harder to hit. And as an industry, I think we, we, we've, it's sexy, it's fun, we get paid well, and we seem to think that we're fighting a polite war, and we are the British and the French fighting circa, you know, 1730 or some bullshit. And we're not. You know, that's not how this works. And we have to remember, it's dirty, it's nasty. The people that are trying to break into our networks don't really give a shit about who we are. They don't care that you're on vacation, right? They don't care who the director is and that you have to tell them anything. You know, it, they, they want their information and they're going to get it. Um, and that's, again, one of the reasons I get real passionate about this is that we screw up so much. And yet we show up here and think, oh, we're doing the right thing, man. Look at how awesome my attack tool is and all this other crap. And every day we've been failing at this job since the 60s, right? I didn't pull out some of the really old quotes from the 70s that demonstrate how shitty the situation really is. And that we continue to fail at this job. But the industry gets bigger. We get paid more money. It keeps getting cooler. There aren't many industries where you can suck as bad. Think if a mechanical engineering had the failure rate that we did. Every time you drove over a bridge, you had a one in, I don't know, five chance of dying. Because right now, when you search through a random website, you got like a one in five chance of getting owned, right? So every bridge would be like, I'm going to stay home today. I think I'll telecommute. Uh, anyway, other questions? Real Two, holy shit.
I don't think you're buying into shit, sir. But <laughs> I, I think you think I'm full of it, but go on. <laughs> so so um, the question for, for the YouTube aware um, is basically, so what? What do we do about it? Um, and, and honestly, so I chose the, the uh, political example, Rince Priebus, as, as like, uh, for a reason, which is, um, again, I'm not telling you what I am, but I watch a lot of Daily Show. Um, <laughs> and it, it does strike me, and even when I, I, I try to be pretty honest, and I read a lot of political uh, material, um, there, there's a huge chasm in the country right now between the right and the left. And there's not a lot of honest intellectual discourse that is occurring around important subjects. There's a lot of rhetoric, and rhetoric gets people riled up, and it's rah-rah, and it gets them to donate money and put up signs and gets people elected and whatever, but it doesn't solve problems, right? Sorry doesn't put thumbs back on, Marge. Um, <laughs> come on. There we go, yeah. <laughs> Slow Simpsons reference there for those that haven't. Woo, yeah. Um, so I really want to try to push honest discourse in this community, like being honest with ourselves. We suck, right? We don't do a good job at defending. Some of the largest advances we've had that have made our networks more secure in the last decade have been better operating systems from Microsoft, right? Windows 8, 64-bit, it's kind of a bitch to pop. When you teach people how to hack into boxes, what operating system do you choose? XP, 32-bit, baby. We still do it today. Why? Because it's easy to learn on and people still use it. What the fuck? I saw somebody the other day railing on Mac. So like, oh my God, I can't believe I have to update to my operating system to Snow Leopard because something's unsupported anymore. Blah, blah. Apple's backwards compatibility, blah, blah. Like, you know why we have security problems in Windows land? Because of backwards compatibility, right? Because Windows XP 32-bit is still a valid operating system, right? Show me some, you know, you know what, what OS 10 version was running when XP came out. 10.1. Show me someone running 10.1 today. Eh. Show me somebody running 10.4. There, there, there's a dude, right? Like, when you walk into an enterprise, you say, all the dudes running XP. When you're a pen tester, you're like, oh, you really? Come on, make it harder. Like. So honestly, we, we pat ourselves in the back for all these advances that we've made, and yet Microsoft's probably made more advances for us than anybody else. All we gotta do is go install Windows 8 64-bit. I don't get paid by them for shit. I don't hold their stock. I can't believe I just said that. But honest to God, it's a good thing. So, so what, I'll get to you in a second. Uh, so all I'm trying to say here is recognize that what we think is true and what we think is right isn't necessarily right, so let's, Calm down the attitude, calm down the, the nerves, and let's figure out what InfoSec looks like in 2012 and what we need to do in the next couple of years rather than thinking like, hey, let's keep popping XP and showing people how to do that. It's like, no offense, it's like, you know, lock picking a two pin lock, a master lock. It's like, yay, I can lock pick. It's like, go break into your own goddamn house now. Like, oh, it turns out our house is really easy for a long time because only one pin worked in our one lock and you could open it with like a toothpick. So. After I pointed that out at like the fourth conference, um, we changed locks because Heidi basically just dropped me off at Home Depot and drove home and said, don't come back until you have new locks. So, <laughs> okay. You have a question. So, so yeah, no, people actually light me up for talking about, well about Microsoft. I gave a talk a couple, a couple years ago, a while ago, about Linux and why I hated Linux at DEF CON, and I walked away from it. Uh, <laughs> I think I was particularly incensed about, like, the fifth time that they had changed the, the USB uh, um, uh, uh, storage drive, mass storage drivers. They seem to change them every season. It drives me fucking batty. Um, but Microsoft spends a ton of money on security research. Right? They're not screwing around. They hire smart people. I know smart people at Microsoft that work on the security side. People I really respect. You know what they've done? A good job. <gasps> oh my God. You know what else I get railed about when I tell people, hey, you don't want to get popped? Go buy a Mac. People are like, well, you, Macs aren't all that more secure. There's all kinds of problems. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, there sure as shit are problems with the Mac. I will be the first to admit it. 
But you know what's not happening? Attackers are not investing the time and energy to write malware for the Mac because it's still not a big enough return on their investment. It's getting close. But every once in a while, you know what's funny? You'll see, an, you'll see some article about the latest malware variant for the Mac that was discovered the other day. I'm like, well, in the time that it took me to read this article, 10 new variants were discovered for Windows. What's your point? Oh, look at that. It's a Trojan horse. And you actually have to click on it and then click OK and then type in your password. But it's malware. I'm like, that's, that, that's not malware, sir. Like, you're a goddamn moron. Um, I'm like, here, I have some websites that you should browse to with your Windows XP box. It'll define this for you. Malware. Oh, I owned your Bank of America account. Um, anyway, so uh, I say a lot of inflammatory stuff just to get people's attention. Hey! Oh, you're telling me five minutes. I thought you were just greeting me. You're very friendly staff here at DerbyCon. It's, thank you. Oh, tip of the hat. Excellent. Thank you. Yay. I have five minutes. Um, I say a lot of inflammatory shit just to get people to wake up when I give talks because it has to be entertaining, um, usually. Uh, anyway, um, but honestly, there's stuff like that that I feel like, you know, I feel that Macs are more secure, not they're more secure to use, I guess would be the best way to put it. And I think Windows 8 is a great step forward from where we've been in the past. And you can hate me for it, you can disagree, and that's cool. And I'm happy to have the discussion. But let's have the discussion, right? That's all I really care about. Let's have a discussion, come to a rational conclusion, move on. And they're in the back. So, hey, I'm not going to touch the national identity thing with a 10-foot pole because there's a lot of privacy issues I don't even want to start to get into with that. Uh, but in general, with respect to two-factor authentication um, and other alternative forms of authentication, we've had alternative ways to do authentication for a long time, both at, for uh, 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 authentication of, uh, of users as well as authentication of very, you know, like our credit cards and that kind of thing. We could, you know, have smart chips running around our cards for years. We've chosen not to have that. There's no driver. There's no economic driver to make any of that happen, right? I was involved in a failed startup that tried to deploy smart cards to people to do set-based transactions in the late 90s. We burned through millions of dollars. You know how many customers we had? Zero. You know how awesome it was to burn through other people's money and not have to have any customers to be responsible for? Awesome. <laughs> like, it was actually awesome up until the point that the money ran out. Then it was not so good, um, especially when you had you know, family, kid, whole deal. Um, but. At the end of the day, I think that there's lots of different ways we can do authentication that we, we don't do because there's no economic driver, because we can't get, I mean, it's a very hard thing to get people to get you issue them a token, to do the identity uh, validation, to get drivers that work with the smart card or the token or whatever. I mean, this is all a complicated problem. Um, I find what's interesting is that what's like the world's biggest single sign-on service right now? Facebook. Facebook solved their single sign-on problem for us. You no, know I don't ever, well, first of all, I don't really use Facebook. Uh, but whenever I'm presented with a website that's like, oh, you can sign on with Facebook. I'm like, GTFO. Like, no, I no freaking way am I, no. Like, even though I know underlying how it works and whatever, I'm not doing it. Like, I don't want to condone Facebook as, like, the single sign-on. Facebook is the identity authority for the planet, right? More so than any government, than anybody else. They can identity proof you. They can figure out who you are. You can go log in with all kinds of different websites with Facebook, and it's scary as hell. I don't, I mean, I, 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 you say evil about Google, you say evil about Apple, I sure shit ain't trusting Facebook, so. Oh, yeah, yeah, on Facebook, it'll ask you, is this your friend's real name? And it'll, it'll be like, does Facebook still ask me if I'm male or female? And I've tried to petition them to just say, or. Um, but the uh, um, what's also um, uh, oh god Facebook snitching the damn it you interrupted my train of thought man now I can't remember anyway Facebook is evil um, oh I know exactly that point but as a community what was interesting for DEF CON how many people went to DEF CON this year the big contest room and everything there's a lot of organization that goes in that contest room and I have a lot of respect for Pyro and the rest of the crew that put that together you know where they did the organizing the pre planning for that this year. Not on the DEF CON forums that DT controls and they have their own, you know, uh, is DT in the room? He's supposed to speak in here next, I think. Thank God. All right. Um, they did it on Facebook. DEF CON, planning on Facebook. I about pooped myself. Like, <laughs> I was shocked. I'm like, you, you would, did privacy, what? No. Like, how is this allowed? Does anyone find this ironic? Nope. 
to just accept it. But we're all sheep, even in this community. Like, oh, no, no, tell other people, don't use Facebook, don't post it. But for us, oh, we know what the hell we're doing. We're security guys. Yeah, you should see all of my unpatched systems. There's a lot of them. Um, but I know what I'm doing. It's cool. It's cool. He says I wasn't terrible. What'd you say? I got the staff guy in the back mumbling about my talk. Any other questions? They're going to kick me out. Sweet. Well, I appreciate you all sticking around, and uh, we'll see you at ShmooCon hopefully later.